Hello, Crime Salad listeners. Welcome back to another episode of Crime Salad, where we dive into the darkest corners of human nature. My name's Ashley. And I'm Ricky. This week, we are going to Carrollton, Texas, where Healy's headquarters are located. Like the the shoe? Exactly. The popular, unique shoe that first made their debut in 2000. I wish I had those shoes. In the heart of Texas, where family values and church Sundays mesh seamlessly with the landscape, lived Nancy Shore and her husband, John Franklin Howard, a son of a preacher who went by the name Frank. Frank was a doting husband. He financially supported the family as they raised their three kids. Their story began with promise rooted in shared Baptist faith and morals and interest in music, which soon led to their marriage in 1983. And they had a daughter in 1985, and then they got a place in Carrollton, Texas, and had two more children. So a family of five were thriving and brought up in a loving religious home. And Nancy embraced her role as a stay-at-home mom. She preferred the title domestic engineer. And Frank steering his career as an accountant. The marriage was noticeably a great one. Family and friends would agree. They both sang in the church choir together and had a strong bond with their children. Their children did all sorts of activities growing up. And Frank even coached his son's soccer team. And they held youth group meetups inside their home. Their family would go on mission trips with their church to different countries to help children in need. Nancy would be a part of the PTA at her kids' school and participate in field trips and events that the school held. Sounds like a nice little family. Right? It's painting a picture of the perfect American family. And they were actually referred to as the family from Leave it to Beaver, the Cleavers. Hmm. Frank even planned out a cruise to Alaska with just him and Nancy, so no kids, to celebrate Nancy's 40th birthday. And he even purchased this amazing ring for her during their trip. Suspicious. You see, Frank, he was full of surprises. He even planned a trip to Beijing for the 2008 Olympics for his family. Dang, that's a trip. Yet, This all-American family lifestyle was hiding dark secrets, which ultimately developed into a story that is quite the opposite. In this Crime Salad episode, we set the stage of a story that is about betrayal, greed, and a fight for survival. I'm on the edge of my seat. So in the year 2009, things took a turn. It was around this time that Nancy and Frank's children were, for the most part, all grown up. Their oldest would be 24 and their youngest child left home. So the couple had an empty nest. And Frank, still being a successful accountant, having over 500 clients, landed an amazing opportunity. He would soon be in a position where money was pouring in. Money never seemed to be an issue, but now they would become even more well off. So you'd think this is a time for them to, like, be all lovey-dovey and go on trips and, like, fall in love again. Like, the the children are all grown up, right? I know when I moved out, my mom was like, see ya. I actually didn't miss you at all. (laughs) That's rough. But yeah, this was a time where Frank and Nancy could focus on their relationship, focus on themselves personally, maybe dabble in some new hobbies. But it seemed that Frank was able to fill that extra time that he had by keeping busy with his work. While Nancy, she didn't have work. She hasn't worked the whole time she was raising her kids because her whole life was built around the children, their home, and her husband. She didn't realize that she was at a point in her life where loneliness and depression crept in. You see that with a lot of people, actually, a lot of women, because, like, raising children, you're so busy, right? There's so much to do for so many years, and then when they're gone, it's like, what do I do now? Yeah, I fear for that myself, personally, because I love being a mom. Yeah. That's, like, my thing. No, I I feel the same exact way. Like, if I'm not, like, helping our kids, it's like, what am I supposed to do? Like, it's kind of my purpose. Right. 
Now, although Frank's amazing opportunity came into their lives, where basically money was coming down like rain, it put a strain on Nancy and Frank's marriage. This new job required Frank to travel a lot. Drake said people with no money act like money isn't everything. It's not everything. To people with no money. Frank continues to fill up his pride bucket. He was set with this new amazing opportunity, and he would eventually be hired as chief financial officer of his client's company. The CFO, the big cheese. Yes. His client, Richard Rowley, was a multi-millionaire, a very wealthy man that was hired by the Department of Defense during the war in Iraq. He provided ICE and other supplies to the troops that were in Iraq, and the company was on its road to success, even assisting with Kuwait. Kind of an odd company, wouldn't you say? Like, they deliver ICE. Yeah, it's one of those things that you wouldn't really realize that makes money. And a lot of money. Right. Now, Frank Howard, he was given a very generous salary and even given a private jet. Mm. You know what this guy reminds me of? Hmm. Scrooge McDuck. You know what was bad about Scrooge McDuck? With all his money, couldn't even really swim in it. No, Hmm. he could, actually. Didn't he 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 swim? swim in it all the time. Eventually, the new exciting travel job would take him to California, specifically to South Lake Tahoe. And the trips became more frequent as time went on. So he was spending more and more time away from his wife. And while on the trip to South Lake Tahoe, Frank visited a casino. And that's where he crossed paths with Suzanne Leontief. Suzanne, a dental hygienist, was going through a divorce. And Frank, being a lone wolf on a business trip to California, was drawn to Suzanne, which ignited the mutual feeling of marital dissatisfaction. He went on to tell her that he, too, was getting a divorce, even mentioning that he and his wife slept in separate rooms. Although it seemed to Suzanne that Frank was in the same boat as her, navigating through the experience of a soon-to-be-divorced individual This was the start of a series of events that unfolded. Now to note, a divorce actually wasn't in the plan at all for Frank and Nancy. While this conversation was happening, Nancy was in Africa with her daughter on a mission trip. According to Nancy, he was a faithful, loving husband and father. A new life with Suzanne seemed to be appealing, and it would go on for a solid three years years. All while Frank kept ties with his deep roots back at home in Texas with his wife and kids. Now, although he would put effort into his marriage with his wife, he seemed to have less and less time for her. He was always traveling for work and sometimes would even leave last minute if he was at home in Texas with his wife. Now, the double life thing that he was living, it became an expensive lifestyle. A lifestyle that was full of financial support from Frank, but also a bunch of false hope and lies. And eventually attempted murder. Yeah. Despite assurances of an impending divorce and living a life with Suzanne, Frank's life with his wife Nancy remained a thing. He held on to the faithful husband role, and while doing that, in the background, he had this relationship with Suzanne. Frank would lie to Suzanne, promising that he was still in the process of getting a divorce, but he kept making excuses and even explained to her that they were separated and he was 100% invested into their relationship. At some point, Suzanne's patience was growing thin, which made Frank's desperation grow. Suzanne herself expressed her frustration with Frank that she wanted to start this new life together in Texas and he always seemed to avoid actually going through with the divorce with his wife. Frank and Suzanne's relationship was more than just a casual affair. Frank expressed his affection for Suzanne and her daughters through his money. His contributions included paying for their softball tournaments and assisting one of Suzanne's daughters financially with her college. Frank also purchased a $30,000 boat, 
Remarkably, within six months of meeting Suzanne, Frank made a significant investment by purchasing a $900,000 home in Santa Cruz entirely in cash. This was followed by the purchase of two condos in South Lake Tahoe worth $380,000. To prove to Suzanne that he was serious about their relationship, she was given a $700,000 IRA account and was put on the payroll at his employer's company so she could get health insurance after her divorce. Dang. He also paid for her travel cost to Dallas so that they could routinely meet. But all of this wasn't enough. Suzanne was tired of the excuses, and she was tired of traveling, and she wanted to make things permanent. I'm curious if Suzanne kept her job as a hygienist around this time. I mean, you'd have to be pretty passionate about teeth. But her name was Leon Teeth. I roll. Now, Frank, he could only think of one way out of the divorce pressures. And just from observing, Frank seemed like he was all about that image. He seemed very selfish, and protecting his pride and reputation were far more important than his wife. I mean, honestly, I never get this because this happens in almost every case that we do that's, you know, domestic focused. Like, why not just divorce? Like, why do they feel the only option is to kill their wife or, you know? Well, he probably had, like, an image to keep up. But, like, to me, killing someone is a lot harder than getting a divorce. And maybe it's the money thing, I know, because you have to split up money and all of that. But I don't know. Just get a damn divorce and then go date whoever you want. Yeah, you should have just swallowed his pride, told Nancy the news, and filed for divorce. But he didn't. He went to extreme efforts to protect this image of his. Of course he did. Now, what's so sad is poor Nancy. She is already feeling like her entire purpose of being a mom is completely gone. And during this time, her husband is living this secret life with some other woman. I feel like it's the ultimate slap in the face. And she was becoming very upset because when he would come home, she would try to plan something around his busy schedule to go do travel plans, something. But the problem with that was that his schedule was so random. It was so hard to book anything. And sometimes he would just leave the house last minute, making it difficult to spend valuable time with Nancy. Well, I'm sure that was frustrating because she's, you know, time away. She's thinking, when he gets home, maybe we can go on a nice trip and we can fix this. But he didn't want to fix it. Like he, you know, he had Suzanne, whatever. He wasn't trying to like spend time together or, or make things better. Yeah, I feel like he was really just trying to keep things with Nancy neutral. Like he wasn't trying to, you know, grow the relationship anymore. It, he was just trying to keep it like stable so that he could. Yeah, it, it, like a functioning thing. Like uh, roommates, essentially. Right. And even out of the frustration of this unorganized schedule of his, she threw a calendar at him one time and the tension in the relationship kept climbing. But she adapted to the change by going to church or hanging out with friends. Now, there were a few times that he would do little things with Nancy. Like one time they went to watch Chicago, their favorite band play. Nancy struggled with depression and the chronic pain of fibromyalgia. And at one point, after Frank went to the doctors for a checkup, they discovered Frank had prostate cancer. And during that time, he was staying at home five days a week for a few months, not working, not traveling, going to close to 80 sessions of radiation. Although this was a rough time, they started to bond back together. Nancy was there to support him every step of the way, and Frank started to get feelings back for Nancy. And soon he was in better health, ready to work again. And each morning when he left, either over the phone or through text, they would share prayers and scriptures. Then in the summer of 2009, another client of Frank's was allegedly being harassed by this guy named Billy Earl Johnson, someone who was far from Frank's polished world. It's believed that Billy was the ringleader of the gang called the Hee Haw Gang. Oh, Hee Haw Gang. Dang, I like that. 
with a history marked by incarceration and drug abuse. Sounds like my Friday night. Billy seemed like the perfect person for Frank to call up and ask him to kill his wife in exchange for some money. And Billy played along. Now, this agreement would drag on for years, where Frank was essentially funding Billy's drug use and other purchases. But Billy and his girlfriend, Stacy, who was helping out with the scam, would never hold up their part of the deal. So he just kept getting money for nothing? Well, of course he's not going to kill her then. It's payday. Right? He was first given an envelope of $60,000 in cash and a photograph of his wife, Nancy. He just threw away the picture of Nancy and pocketed the money. $60,000. Dang. And Frank told him to make the murder appear to be an accident. $60,000, that's a lot of money. It is. I mean, a lot of the cases we do, it's like $3,000, $4,000, something like that. Probably less. Pack of gum and cigarette. Right. And Billy, he burned through it all pretty quickly, actually. And when the money went dry, Billy requested more money. So he got another envelope with $35,000. It's not a bad deal. And Billy kept this going. Like we said, this went on for years. And he would always come up with an excuse, like things kept getting in the way, he would end up getting arrested for having drugs on him, and Frank would bail him out of jail. And so the money just kept conveniently coming. And in Billy's eyes... Like Ricky said, why would he not keep this going? He keeps getting paid. Yeah. Free uh, money. Inflation's a little high. I'm going to need a little more money for milk. <laughs> Can you guess how much in total he was given? Take a wild guess. I mean, at least 100000 $1 million in cash right. and another million dollars in bail bonds. Holy cow. And what do you think this maybe was a little suspicious like this guy keeps getting bailed out of jail i mean one million dollars in bail bonds well he's already dug the hole so deep i mean he's like come on man i've given you a million dollars like just just do the job already two million dollars really i mean he kept well, <laughs> bailing yeah. Him out, but yeah it just makes me feel like why didn't they question why frank kept bailing him out i don't know why but it reminds me of like there was a youtube video where they were asking bill gates like how much does a gallon of milk cost, this and that? And he had no idea. Like, he was throwing out, like, crazy numbers. It's like, I don't know. That's what it reminds me of. He's like, oh, yeah, kill your wife. Mm, 60, 60K, definitely. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm going to need another 60K. I got a parking ticket. <laughs> I don't know. Billy was probably around his family and friends like, guys, I just got $60,000 from this guy. Yeah, this guy's an idiot, and I'm going to milk it for all it's worth. Yep, Frank kept pouring money into Billy's pockets that were always empty. Billy, he was living large, and he even shared some of his earnings with his family and his friends. He had purchased a boat, a camper, and he would throw these crazy parties at hotels. He purchased three motorcycles for his kids and go-karts for his grandkids. Little Susie, you're going to college. Yes, ma'am. And a nice riding mower. Riding lawnmower. Oh, I was joking. It's, he really got a nice riding lawnmower. Wow. Yeah. A nice one. Good for him. Now, Frank would end up giving up on Billy, following through with murdering of his wife after three long years. Didn't seem like it was going to happen. So Billy would end up in jail one final time, thinking that Frank would bail him out, but he ended up not this time. We still got a lot of money. Right. Now, while Billy was in jail, his girlfriend's son, Dustin, started to offer to help Frank out. Well, of course he did. Billy was probably like, this is a great business opportunity. Go for it. He'll give you a handful of a couple thousand dollars. Now, Frank, he would offer him $24,000 in cash and told him to beat his wife to death with a baseball bat while she was at a Mothers of Preschoolers convention. Now, Dustin, just like Billy, he blew through that cash pretty quickly on methamphetamine. And Frank handed him some more money. Dustin Hurams was pulled over during the early morning hours, being that he was suspiciously driving around for hours along with a passenger. 
and he gave the police a few different stories during the time he was pulled over. Police questioned why he was so far away from home, and Dustin explained that he was getting money from his uncle. And then the person changed from uncle to stepdad. Then it changed to a family friend who they called John. So you get it. The inconsistencies weren't adding up. And then he blurted out randomly that he was a hitman and he was hired to kill a woman in Carrollton. I think that's like number one rule. Don't admit to being a hitman. Now, this wasn't taken very seriously. They just assumed that he was high on some kind of drug. Supposedly, they did look into this, but I'm not really sure of what they looked into specifically because nothing came up. But maybe something would have came up, you know, if they actually... I guess now that you're saying it, though, like, if someone was like, I'm a hitman, and he's like some druggy dude, you're gonna be like, sure you are, bud. Oh, uh, yeah, let's take you down to the station. <laughs> go, go, Inspector Gadget, hitman. Like, why are you driving around for, like, several hours at night, like, 3 o'clock in the morning? But like you said, who says that to the police? There was no reason for him to be driving around this late at night in this neighborhood that was completely away from his hometown. And this conversation was all recorded from the police dash cam. And I'm sure that could be used as, like, evidence later on, too, right? Yeah, and although the police did not believe him at the time, it was only after what happened to Nancy that they were able to piece these two situations together. Could you imagine them not believing you? Like, you'd go home and lay in your bed, and and you'd be like, now what? I tried to turn myself in. Billy, the hee-haw ringleader, who was still behind bars, had someone else in his circle that Frank felt was a good fit for this job. Billy's nephew, Michael Specht, would eventually be hired by Frank to murder his wife. Michael Specht brought on a friend of his, an old cellmate, Michael Lawrence, to help with the murder. The day was August 18th, 2012, when Nancy drove to church to witness a baptismal ceremony of her friend's daughter that was scheduled for 7.30 p.m. Without any clue whatsoever, someone was waiting to follow her home that evening. And during her drive home, she was unknowingly being followed. Following her was a silver Nissan sedan, and inside the car were two men who were later confirmed to be Michael Specht and Michael Lawrence on their mission to complete the job that they were hired for. Before making it home, she stopped at a local taco restaurant called Taco Bueno, and she picked up some food at the drive-thru. And then she made her way home. It was while she parked the car inside her garage of her home and exited the vehicle when she was grabbed from behind and put in a chokehold and threatened with a gun to give up her purse. In her quiet, safe neighborhood, this wasn't something that she was cautious about. And for a split second, she assumed that this was some strange prank. But quickly she realized that this was shockingly happening. Nancy was turned around with aggression and faced with a man who she did not recognize, wearing a baseball cap and pointing a gun at her face. In a state of shock and confusion, she mistakenly, in a panic, gave him the taco bueno bag, which frustrated him. And then she gave the man the purse. Before taking off, he pulled the trigger as the gun was pointing to her forehead and she was left there to die a moment that would forever alter the course of her life because she would survive. The bullet entered Nancy's head just above her left eye, and although severely injured, with a voice in her head telling her to get up, she was covered in blood and bleeding out onto the floor as she made her way onto her feet and slipped in her own blood, falling on her face down on the garage floor. Ugh, that's horrible. She managed to get into her car and push the OnStar button, but the car had to be turned on, and she remembered that the key was in her purse that the man took. Nancy fought for her life as she managed to carefully walk through the blood-covered cement garage floor, trying not to slip. When she made it inside, she was able to call the police from her landline phone. You can hear the shock and pain in her voice as she spoke with the dispatcher, pleading for help. 
not sure if she was going to survive. Once the police arrived at the house, weapons drawn, it startled Nancy. She possibly was thinking that she was being attacked again, but she was reassured that they were there to help. The EMTs brought her to the hospital. Nancy's vital signs were starting to slip, and she was having trouble breathing. Police started to investigate this shooting with the information they were initially given from the dispatcher who asked Nancy questions. Nancy told the dispatcher on the phone that it was a white male in his mid-20s who did this to her. Police looking into her personal life, they started to reveal the layers of Frank's betrayal. One of the police officers knew Nancy and notified the pastor of their same church. The pastor was able to notify her friends and family of the attack. And when anyone would call the hospital to inquire about Nancy's condition, the information was kept private, especially in this case, where she was attacked by someone which would make her stay at the hospital unsafe. Victims of unlawful acts are often given an alias when they are at the hospital. And this was the case during Nancy's stay. Nancy and Frank's oldest child got the news that her mother had been shot. And at first, it was unbelievable. Her mother wasn't the type of person to get herself into a situation like this where she would be shot. She made a call to her dad's cell phone. He didn't answer the call, but noticed she called a little later and called back. She would then tell him that her mom had been shot. Frank's reaction was pure shock. He couldn't breathe and told her that he would race to the airport and be on his way home. Well, where was he at that time? So at this time, he was in South Lake Tahoe, California, at a casino gambling. Uh, The alibi. Yes. Now, Frank, he wasn't able to get a flight back home right away. It wouldn't be until the next morning at 6 a.m. when he would get a flight. Frank was picked up in Dallas, Texas by his oldest daughter. And once they arrived at the hospital, Frank was stumbling into the hospital and he collapsed to the ground. Eventually, he was able to make it into Nancy's room and sit at her bedside. And he would be startled any time one of the monitors would make noise. Honestly, it probably was in pure shock. He was like, I can't believe the person I paid actually did it. (laughs) Oh my, you're right. I don't know why the kid even did it. I mean, his, his what, stepdad or whatever it was, he got paid over a million dollars. Should have just kept it going. Kept it going. Now, the doctors notified the family of Nancy's condition, and they explained the unique travel of the bullet. So the bullet, like we said, entered her head and actually traveled down her throat into her right lung. She would be left permanently injured in multiple places like her eye area and her throat. She stayed in the ICU with a breathing tube and would have to undergo surgery. Unable to talk, she would sign to her family things that she needed. She was surrounded by the love of her family, and she would survive this attack. So that's why in the 911 call, her voice is kind of raspy then. Yeah, I never thought about that. Yeah, because I think it actually, like, pierced through her. So, did I don't know, this is always weird to me because, like, she was shot in the face. Like, did she have any type of, like, brain damage or anything? Luckily, no. She had permanent damage and a collapsed lung. And sadly, she would lose her left eye. But she survived, and she didn't experience any brain damage. She would have to do physical therapy, but the bullet missed all of her vital organs, and she still is alive and well today. It's crazy. Yeah. And just like Nancy supported Frank as he went through the hours of chemotherapy, Frank sat beside her making promises that they would get through this. She heard the news that her left eye would be removed, which was devastating. The doctor who did the surgery did a fantastic job. If you get the chance to check out the pictures of the after, you can barely notice, really. Yeah, honestly, it looks really good. Plus, she has the glass eye now, too. So, I mean, you barely can tell. And they actually had to completely reconstruct her eyelid because it was in pieces. 
Ugh. And her eye area. Yeah, it would be, I guess. Yeah. Now, at this point, the police wanted to speak with Nancy to get information as to what happened. But she wasn't at a state to speak with them. And the doctors informed the family that her condition was looking good. So relieved, Frank agreed to speak with the police. Hopefully they could get a little more information or at least some clues as to what could have happened for someone to attack Nancy. So Frank was asked to come down to the station to talk with police. And he made a few convincing claims, one being that Nancy was a very caring person. She was always trying to see the good in people. Nancy was the type of person who would go out of her way to help someone. There was even a time that Frank explained when someone knocked on their front door and asked for a place to stay, and she helped them with the hotel room. So him saying that kind of makes it feel like it could have been a straight-up burglary situation. And this is what the oldest daughter also thought. Nancy must have been trying to help someone when she was attacked. So the person, though, that attacked her, they only took her purse, though, right? They didn't, like, come into the house or anything. Now, according to investigators, the crime scene didn't show any sign that someone was rummaging through the house. There was no like additional footprints, with being that there was blood all through the floor, the garage floor, or anything like that. Now, Frank's interview with the police went pretty smooth. He was very willing to help give any information they needed. He didn't appear to be nervous. He wasn't combative. And he also offered a generous reward for anyone to come forward who has any information. And the police agreed, but they wanted to first exhaust all leads. What if Billy just shows up and tells everything he knows and collects a reward. I mean, that's more I money. I wouldn't doubt it. <laughs> oh, man, Billy, you missed an opportunity. Now, a few things came to the picture pretty quickly. And like we were just talking about, once Billy, the man in jail, heard about the shooting, he made a call to the police to give them all the details about Frank. Police also made the realization that he was hired to kill someone's wife when he was arrested for hanging around Nancy's neighborhood. And they also learned about Frank's affair. And that came to light when they took his cell phone and did a search on his phone and found a few telling things. One of those being intimate texts between another woman. The trip to South Lake Tahoe, California at a casino was discovered to be more of a personal trip, not a business trip. And he had been carrying out this secret love affair with another woman for over three years. And this woman went by the name Suzanne Leon Teef. The hygienist. And Suzanne confirmed with police when they spoke with her that she was with Frank at the casino on the day that his wife was shot. Well, at least uh, his alibi is going to work out. Maybe. All boxes needed to be checked. Like we said, while this was all happening, in the background, tips were coming in. People were coming forward. So they had this microscope on Frank for sure. And plus, we all know it's always the husband, right? His children were told about the affair and they were completely thrown off. This was never like him. They never saw any signs and they never had any hunch that this was happening. I mean, it's pretty good at hiding it. Yeah, the only thing that his kids would say was that they did notice he was traveling a lot more than he usually does. But other than that, a secret affair never crossed their minds. I mean, the big picture, Frank on the outside, he's this faithful husband, right? I mean, honestly, who's going to think he's living this double life for three years? Right, he's this really good guy, awesome husband, awesome dad. And he was hoping to keep that image going. And he had no plans whatsoever to talk about this side relationship of his. But once the police took a peek at his phone, they had told the kids about it. And so he had to come clean. He had told his kids and Nancy, who was at the hospital already in a huge amount of pain. And he laid it all out. Well, part of it. He had called Nancy on the phone, telling her that he had been seeing someone else for the last three years. However, he was clear on one thing. He had nothing to do with the shooting. Talk about a terrible time to bring that up. 
Like your wife is laying in bed, dying from a gunshot. Right. And you're like, also, I know that kind of sucks, but I've been cheating on you for three years. It would be heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. Nancy was crushed by the news, but still holding on to trust. She was convinced that he was innocent. She never would have believed for a minute that he could do such a thing. Like we said, this was completely out of character. So when the police showed up to arrest her husband, she was all about how there's been some kind of big mix-up. The break in the case came from surveillance footage at the church. It captured a silver Nissan following Nancy as she left the parking lot moments before she was shot in her garage. And if you remember, this would be the two Michaels who were following her from the church during the evening. Although the surveillance footage couldn't pick up the license plate on the vehicle, it was noticeable that two men were in the car. The surveillance footage even caught one man getting out of the car and walking into the church during the ceremony to go to the bathroom. So, I mean, that's confirmation right there, like, of who was in the car. Right. And to add to this, her cell phone was tracked and found in a nearby dumpster. And also her purse, her wallet, and inside her wallet was $11. And her ID was also in the dumpster. So this guy who held her at gunpoint, demanding her purse, then shooting her in the face, didn't even take the $11 that was inside her wallet. I mean, didn't he work up a thirst? Like he could have bought like two Gatorades, a monster, pack of cigarettes. He definitely opened the wallet because the police noticed that... The ID was just thrown in the dumpster. So it made police suspicious that this was all planned. Like he opened the wallet, checked the ID, made sure that he shot the right person and threw it all away. Yeah, that's probably what happened. Now, around this time is also when another police officer told investigators about a young man named Dustin that we talked about earlier who was pulled over. Then, of course, there was the inmate, Billy Earl Johnson, who came forward with some information. You know, the one who was originally hired to murder Nancy. But instead, he just took a bunch of Frank's money. Leader of the hee-haws. Hee-haw! Now, I do want to note here, we've been calling him Frank during this episode. Although the people he hired throughout the story all knew him as John, which is his real name. But it wasn't common for him to go by that name. Instead, he usually went by the name Frank, which is his middle name, Franklin. So the police found the connection between John slash Frank and the murder scene. Stacy, who was the girlfriend of Billy, the guy in jail, came forward, giving the detectives a photo of the guy who was creating this whole murder scheme. Connecting the dots that Frank, that the police knew, was actually John. And they were able to confirm how Frank could be connected to Billy. Billy at the time was talking to a woman who worked at this company that made flavors. And this company just so happened to be a client of Frank's. In July of 2009, the woman broke up with Billy and he didn't take it very well and would threaten her and he would even show up at her work. So everyone at the company knew to steer clear of this guy. And Frank had the idea to give him a call. And so one day, Billy's phone rang. The person on the phone said his name was John, and he needed someone to kill his wife. Now, all of these allegations floored those who knew Frank as this doting husband, an innocent man, Nancy's aunt would say, quote, We all thought that he was the epitome of a good Christian man. At his bond hearing, Frank's supporters filled the courtroom. While on bail, one of Frank's daughters had her wedding. Nancy, wanting her daughter to have her dream wedding, requested the court to ease Frank's bail conditions for the weekend so he could be there. And after all that she went through, she still wanted her daughter to be happy. She said it was tough, but it was also a time of happiness. She's too nice. 
And so Michael Lawrence was arrested for the shooting and sentenced to 60 years in prison for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. His conviction was overturned on appeal, and he was tried again and found not guilty. The state then charged him with conspiracy to commit murder, which he pleaded guilty to and received 10 years in prison minus eight and a half years served. Frank Howard was charged with attempted capital murder and tried in August of 2014. He was convicted and sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 30 years, which means that he will be about 85 years old when he will be eligible to be released from prison. They could release him right to a nursing home. In the wake of everything, Nancy's resilience was nothing short of remarkable. She had to face the fact that her husband of more than 30 years had been living this secret life for three years and that someone had left her for dead. This would be a huge life adjustment. Still, her journey as a survivor was very complicated. She had to deal with being betrayed and she had to find strength. And the police even told Nancy that they found a picture of Frank, Suzanne, and her daughters in a picture frame with the word love in his office. And now Frank Howard faces the consequences of his actions, locked in jail among criminals he had tried to hire at a time. The narrative of Nancy Shore and Frank Howard illustrates the devastating impact of adultery, the destructive power of lies and the unbreakable spirit of those who survive the unthinkable. Nancy's narrative, in particular, demonstrates the ability to find a way forward, even in the face of unspeakable despair. In the wake of everything, Nancy's resilience was nothing short of remarkable. She had to face the fact that her husband, of more than 30 years, had been living a secret life for three years, and that someone had left her for dead. This would be a huge life adjustment. It was extremely hurtful when she found out about the many financial endeavors with his secret lover, particularly the $900,000 Santa Cruz property, which he signed the papers on her own birthday. Still, her journey as a survivor was very complicated. She had to deal with being betrayed and find strength. Honestly, just get a dang divorce. And can you believe this? Many of his family members support Frank after all this. Like, they think that he is not guilty. Not guilty? But he hired someone. Right? After all Twice. of the people. And how many people? There's like four or five, all of the Hee Haw gang. <laughs> Hee Haw! They were all hired. And they all said that they were hired. So... Why would they make those things up? I don't know. And that completes this week's episode, titled The Shadows of Trust. It's a good title. Be sure to subscribe wherever you're listening. And if you'd be so kind, give us five stars and tell us how much you love us. Oh, one more thing. What? Get a divorce. Don't kill anyone. Get a divorce already. Yeehaw! Yeehaw gang, hashtag woo. On a steel horse I ride. <laughs> <laughs>